Hey everyone, it's your Kawaii boy Monty. Thank you for coming to be cute with me today. As requested in the various polls I sent out on my community tab and on my social media, I'm going to be off screen for this video and I'm going to be doing a more thorough, longer voiceover, which, um, thank you, I guess. I wasn't really sure if anyone wanted to listen to part of my life story that badly in this way, um, but most people voted for it, and uh, I think I, I like this idea anyways in the end, so I'm going to go for it. Before we start, um, first of all, hi. <laughs> it's my birthday. Uh, the, the day that I'm going to be posting this video on June 19th, uh, it is my birthday, so yay for me. Uh, I get to live another year, so that's awesome. That said, though, that isn't the only thing that's going on today, and I do want to take just a little second to talk about Juneteenth otherwise known as Emancipation Day. It is a very important and significant day for Black Americans, and I want to talk about it here. Technically, I'm not American anymore. I, I live in France, but I, being born and raised in the U.S., I still find it very important to know the history of and to talk about, and also how important it is to be paying it forward as a non-Black person. If I may pull a suggestion, I would go for the Marsha P. Johnson Institute. If you could do anything for my birthday, I would recommend giving them a donation. They are a foundation that centralizes supporting Black trans individuals. Black trans folk are the pillar of pride as we know it today, and we need to be able to be there to support them. So if you could just, if you want to do anything for my birthday, anything at all, I would suggest sending a few bucks their way, please. Thank you. I appreciate that and those two little things I wanted to mention, but let's get into the subject of the video now. When people ask me how I got into the Lolita, and this is, you know, a very fair thing to ask, um, the usual answer I give is me talking about how I learned about J fashion in general through a girl that I had a crush on when I was in middle school. She was a big fan of Antique Cafe, which is a J-pop group uh, from the 2000s, if you don't know. And they wear a style called Oshareke, which I, I, in shorthand, I like to describe it as like the scene cousin of Visual K. It's the more poppy, the more bright, uh, sort of uh, equivalent to it. And it was through learning about J fashion in general that I did come across uh, Lolita fashion and learn about its existence. At the time, I thought to myself, oh, you know, that's cool, that's neat, you know, cool clothes. I didn't think much of it other than, oh, that's neat. Later on in life, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know how I got to this point, but somehow... I came across Lovely Lore's videos, uh, I think as one does, um, especially in that era um, <laughs> of Lolita. This was in 2012, I believe, that I came across Lore's videos, and something clicked in my mind. Something, just some sort of switch hit, and it kind of made me realize for a second, like, wait, there are people, like, actually wearing this for real, just living their lives? And you know they're present, you know that like like that that's it, it was a big whole epiphany, and it made me realize oh well if people are out here and they can just wear it and buy the clothes then you know why couldn't I I think it looks great that's what led to my phase where I started pining for Lolita fashion in general on Tumblr because that's where I was really active at the time. And, uh, the, you know, in, in, in terms of what first got me into Lolita, that was, that was you know, that's history. That's, that's where I tend to cut off when I tell people. In terms of my first piece, though, um, I, I, the story behind it, I tend to not really go into that, that, that strongly. And the reason why that is, is because it's not inherently a very happy story. Um, it, it can be a bit of a downer in some places. And this is the part where, you know, for that, since I'm going to be continuing it and telling you the story of my first Lolita piece, 
uh, this is the part where I'm going to leave my own content warnings for you. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit, I think, here and there about mental illness, but this is mostly going to be talking about physical illness, actually. It's going to be talking um, about chemotherapy and about tumors, um, not cancer per se, because I'm... I'm like not positive about whether it was actually cancer for real seas, um, but it's a lot of stuff adjacent to it. And I know that can be a lot for some people for any other various reasons. So um, if, if you're not in a good state right now to be watching it for any reason, I totally understand if you want to click off. Um, thank you for watching this far anyways. Um, but uh, for now, uh, let's let's get into it. Let, let's get into the story of my very first Lolita fashion piece. So I'm going to try to paint, I guess, the sort of scenery for you to understand where I was uh, around this time. So it's early 2013. Uh, I'm I'm 19 years old at this time. Uh, in like the latter half of me being 19. Um, I'm, I'm still pining for Lolita on Tumblr, uh, mainly pining over, <laughs> mainly pining over Angelic Pretty, um, just because it was, you know, to the early 2010s, and that was the big hit, you know, at the time. Um, although it did like a little bit of Innocent World on the side, but uh, 19 years old was a really, really tough age for me. Otherwise, um, I was feeling pretty lost. And my mental illness was kind of, uh, my mental health was kind of down the shitter uh, during this year for a lot of reasons. Mainly, uh, I was trying to do community college, and I was fortunate enough that my mother had paid for me to go to community college, but I was definitely not ready for community college. And I ended up failing a couple classes, and the fact that I was failing made me. Um, it, it, it made me feel, I guess, um, I don't know how to word this other than, well, my mother was a, you know, traditional conservative Filipino mom. Uh, and I, you know, I really wanted to make her happy and make her proud still for a while. So this really crushed my mental health a lot, knowing that I was failing and that I was having difficulties. Um so uh, I wasn't doing great. Eventually, at that time, I, I dropped out of college um, because I just um, I just wasn't doing well at all. Not one bit. Not not one bit at all. Um, but I still wanted to be doing something with myself. Uh, I wasn't working because at, at the time, my I think my mother told me that I shouldn't do any work at all until I finish school. And then I wasn't going to school because I was really scared then, you know, to be failing again. But I still wanted to do something with myself. So I was doing volunteer work. I was volunteering for the Hawaiian Humane Society at the time. I was working, at, I was volunteering um, in a Petco to help uh, look after the cats that were put there and to help with any adoptions that were being made. So I think it was around March uh, of this year in 2013 that, you know, with me being 19, um, I think it was my mother and I both decided it was about time for me to have my first gynecologist appointment. Um, so I ended up going to a gynecologist for the first time then just, you know, just to get the first big old checkup. She goes for the the normal checkup with the like the scapula or whatever it's called. I, I forgot the name of it. She goes in there to check, and she seems to be having some trouble, like um, looking. I guess like she's kind of silent for a while. She's looking there, and the next thing she tells me is she tells me something's up. I need you to go get an ultrasound. I go to get that ultrasound. And uh, what they end up finding um, pretty easily is that I have a 13 centimeter long tumor attached to my left ovary. And the reason why, um, you know, they, they, they had, my, my gynecologist had asked me to get that ultrasound in the first place was because apparently, I guess, this tumor was so large that it was causing some like blockages in her vision, I think is what I'm pretty sure 
the reason why she asked me to get it so quickly is that she just knew that something wasn't right up there physically. This surprised me because um, I didn't feel anything at the time. I'm pretty positive I had like no symptoms. And the only things that um the, the the only thing that like was off was that i stopped uh menstruating like after 15 like i just stopped menstruating i started um getting some masculinization and my hormones were off i was getting testosterone like more than um than that was i guess supposedly normal um and it was apparently because this tumor was uh you know um, emitting, it was emitting testosterone. The, this it was around here that I met my gyno oncologist for the first time because obviously we needed to get this tumor out of me. They 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 end up doing like a sort of C-section sort of situation on me. They can't do it non-invasively because the tumor was just too large and they needed to take both the tumor and the ovary out of me through like a big cut underneath my stomach so you know i've got i've got that under me it has healed very well and it is right under my stomach though so i can't show it off and, and make it be so cool but it's there they had it done the the surgery was very quick maybe about like half an hour and i woke up half an hour later the um surgeon came in to let me know that i was going to be okay um they told me that i'm all good there was no problem whatsoever with the surgery and that I'll still be able to have babies, which, okay, I didn't ask, but I guess, you know, fine. Um, and I ended up staying in the hospital for two days to recover. And, and then once I was able to walk again, I um, went home and uh, started recovering for about, uh, I think it was about three Three, three weeks or so more so that I can f fully have the scar recover. I was very lucky in that I didn't get st stitches. I got this really awesome glue thing, I'm pretty sure, where it's like, it was just like this transparent substance that's like seals up to the scar and like just peels away on its own when it's ready to, when this, when like a scab shows up on its own. And that was really cool. And that helped with the recovery, I think, to make it be or feel less painful. It was rough, but I recovered. And so I had to go to see my gyno oncologist again um, after this month to do a follow up, you know, just to, I guess, for me, in my head, I was thinking, oh, OK, we're going to go check on the scar to see if it's healing correctly, you know, to see if I need anything else to care for it. Um, so I go to the follow-up one month later and I get, b b before he even says hello, but before, before the surgeon even says hello to me, we even like exchange greetings. He, he, he goes through the door and he gives me the, in hindsight, the, the most so awkward of a delivery that it is both really sad and really, I guess, really funny. He he goes to me and he's like, hey, we looked at the tumor. You're going to need chemotherapy. Yeah, sorry. Like like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this sounds really bad to maybe some of you listening. And it probably is. It probably is really, really bad bedside matter to, to be, you know, to, to deliver it like that, to be like, hi, you know, <laughs> uh, sorry, you're going to need um, uh, treatment <laughs> or something like that. It, I, I'm sure I didn't mean it that way, but it cer certainly came off this way. He had like this wide smile and everything, like he was trying to his best to be positive. Um, but uh, that was the news I got. Uh, he... We, I actually did get to talk about it with him and look at the actual report that they looked at the tumor further and they said it was something called a Sertoli Leydig tumor, which uh, apparently is really rare. It is, um, like I'm trying to remember, it's like point, I think it's a point five or less in the nose so percent of like all ovarian tumors so it's very rare it's caused i think by like a, a genetic a mutation in in one gene i don't know the name of the gene but it's it's caused by a genetic mutation somewhere and uh you know obviously i look it up 
I don't to to me and all like my spoony friends like you know you know like whatever is going on with you is a little fucked when the first results you see for something you have is scientific journals like just all freaking scientific journals it's like ah shit <laughs> what i also saw that was talked about in the report that they did of my tumor was that the cells that were in there were something called borderline which is to say that they're not malignant guaranteed but they're also not guaranteed to be benign they're like thinking about being malignant and i think that alone was enough to have them worry and think well you know if if they're about to turn malignant then there's nothing saying that like it's impossible for me to have malignant uh you know cancer cells in my body so um, what they did for me, I believe, is called adjuvant chemotherapy, where it's sort of like, a, you know, for good measure sort of thing to, to super make sure that I didn't have any cancer um, when I was really at risk for it. Uh, at first, how I reacted to it is like, I, I really didn't know what to do. Um, I wasn't really, I don't remember reacting actually much at all at first. Um, I think uh, it was just a very surreal experience for me initially. Um, before you start chemotherapy, um, you, something you have to do is to sign papers. You have to sign a lot of papers, and I think they're waivers. I don't remember the exact contents of, tem of them because I don't think I read them very thoroughly. From what I remember, it is basically papers that you have to sign that go, yes, I agree that I might die or something like that um, with these papers. Uh, it was, in retrospect, looking back at it, it was very harrowing just in the moment it took me a very long time to realize what was happening i end up breaking the news of this to my friend group uh and and that naturally everyone is really supportive um i don't remember the exact gap of like receiving the news and actually starting the chemo but i did know that receiving the news it was close enough to my birthday which is in June. It was close enough that it gave my best friend, Mary, who is still my best friend today, um, it gave her an idea. And she knew about all of my Lolita pining because we were mutuals on Tumblr and I, you know, was reblogging all these things about Lolita on Tumblr. <laughs> and so what she decided to do was to arrange something special with uh, my friend group where everyone got to pool money together to buy me my first cord, which is still something extremely, like just really, really sweet. I did, as thanks, end up drawing all of that friend group dressed up in Lolita and in OG. Unfortunately, the art to that has been lost to time, though, but I remember having a lot of fun with it, basically assigning different sub-styles to each of my friends at the time. You know, it was really fun. So they were able to pool money together um, enough to get me a full cord from Bodyline, since you know Bodyline was like the brand that you were supposed to go to as a plus size Lolita with not a lot of money. And the dress that they bought for that cord in question was one that caught my attention because A, it fit my measurements. Uh, hello uh, to all newbie plus size Lolitas. Don't pick a dress specifically because it fits you. Pick a dress because it fits you and you love it. And B, I thought the dress was cute. And this uh, dress that we're talking about in question is none other than L304, the antique clock body line OP. I found out just recently that this dress has a reputation. It's not super infamous, it's not controversial, it's no radioactive cupcakes or anything, um, but it's got something. Some sort of reputation as like, I guess, a deceptive pest. It is a simple piece, you know, at first glance looking at it, but actually in practicality, it's tricky to cord well with. It's an eclectic print with seemingly random motifs of just clocks and musical notes and argyle and polka dots and aside from black it has some strange choices for colorways with colors that are hard to cord with featuring fluorescent sacks warm lavender 
green, just green in general. And uh, the border print is a brown that just, it's never the same. No matter what lighting you put it in, it, it feels like that every priest has like a different brown used for the border. And I don't understand it. I knew someone that was buying on Lace Market and the seller offered this person a skirt uh, of this print as a freebie. Uh, the buyer said no, but the seller forcibly gave it anyways in the sale. So um, some sort of reputation, but uh, I didn't care. I liked the dress and I still like the dress and it grew to be something really important to me. Uh, just a few days before starting chemo, I got the bodyline package in the mail and I got to try everything on for my first ever coordinate. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, maybe for, you know, me personally, um, I still have a few of my first chords documented. And uh, here it is, my first ever Lolita chord, June 14th, 2013. Soon after that, it was time for me to start chemotherapy. Um, first of all, shout out to the oncology team at the Kapiolani Medical Center in Honolulu for being MVPs. Being in the medical field sucks, like just in general. Uh, being in chemo uh, absolutely sucked. Um, but the oncology team, the nurses, uh, the phlebotomists in that field, uh, in in that oncology center uh, in Kapiolani, um, they were they were all angels. Every single one of them. They were all really really sweet people that were super accommodating. And I couldn't say a single bad thing about them. With how nice they were, I knew they would be accepting with what I decided to do next. So my birthday, June 19th, was my third day of chemo. My 20th birthday. I was going to be spending my 20th birthday on chemo. I knew I was going to be sitting in that chair in the oncology ward, feeling cold, hooked up to chemicals, pissing out the chemicals, which smell really awful, by the way. And on chemo, my gag reflux became really sensitive. So that was a very fun, vicious cycle. No, it wasn't. And watching another episode of some nothing show on TLC to pass the time before falling hard asleep at five o'clock. So to make my 20th birthday special, I decided to wear the antique clock OP. It wasn't a complete cord because, again, chemo sucks, uh, but I took it with me. And despite everything, you know, despite the whole situation, it was actually a good birthday because not only were the nurses extra sweet to me on that day and even gifted me a bouquet of flowers, uh, but I got to sit there doing the normal chemo stuff in my first ever Lolita piece that was gifted to me by my friends. For chemo, I had a total of three cycles um, of one full week and two like mini weeks. So basically like uh, one full week and then one day uh, for two weeks. I had that three times. So nine weeks later, I finished my chemo. Everything went well with my follow-up appointments after. And uh, after I recovered, uh, I immediately went job searching part because you know i still wanted to make myself feel useful i wasn't ready to go back to school yet but i still wanted to do something um but part also because i was really excited at this prospect to be able to start making my own money so that i could start buying lolita on my own it is now 10 years later 10 years since i started lolita 10 years since i went through chemo and i'm now 30 instead of 20. I knew that this was coming, so naturally I found myself reflecting a little bit on this. And when time passes, I think we, you know, we kind of want to think about where we are now and what there is to learn now that we're older and hopefully wiser. And if there's any lesson that I want you to take from me sharing this part of my life with you, it's this, that in a world where we're constantly throttled by fear, by overstimulation, by sickness and by stress, it's important to remember that the good memories you have are yours to cherish and to hold on to. The Lolita fashion community is very international. We are constantly connecting to people across oceans via the internet. And when you spend so much time in online communities, you are destined to come across a myriad of people and perspectives. Anyone who's been deep enough in fandom definitely knows this feeling. And these opinions that you find might include distaste or even hatred for a piece that you value. 
most people I know are either lighthearted or jokey enough to not let this hatred become malicious. And a lot of it is just genuine and understandable disappointment of trusted brands not delivering on quality or design. But I've been around long enough to sometimes see it get nasty or gratuitous. But my focus isn't on that. My focus is in how important it is for you to remember that this hobby and this fashion also exists for your own sake outside of this community. This is something that I think everyone recognizes as good advice, and yet community opinions are so strong and pervasive in this fashion that most of us struggle with actually following through with it. It's the voice in the back of your head that actually has you debating over whether or not you should wear mismatching sneakers with your core despite feeling foot pain. The one that derides you for not color matching everything perfectly despite that being literally impossible. Or for going blouseless in hot summers. And it's even the voice in your head that tells you that your cord has to be good. This belief is something that I really think is one of the most difficult things to do with liking Lolita in the modern age. Not advanced cording, not tying waist ties really well, not modeling for angelic pretty, and not being the most fabulous person at the tea party. It's to never forget what this fashion really means to you when you live in a world so big and vast and inescapable. And I think my past self understood it best when, in defiance to sickness, I chose to be frilly, simply because it made me happy. That is the story of my beginning in Lolita fashion and why the infamous, deceptive, and sometimes difficult antique clock OP by body line will always have a place in my closet and in my heart. This love will never be taken away from me and neither will yours.